coming up in this episode. I have to practice gratitude and appreciation and you know, optimism and an indomitable spirit and a contemplative deep attunement with peace and et cetera, we are actually walking up that mountain and we are getting closer and closer to that place. And gradually over the course of life, the inner voice starts to then become more active. And if you tune into that inner voice, that's kind of like your antennae through which you're catching the radio mm. signals that are coming from that creative force. You're listening to the Book Talk Today podcast a podcast that inspires readers to obtain valuable insights to inform, educate, and improve lives. My name is Orn Abdi. I'm an avid reader, best known for the creation of the One Minute Book Review community, and I'm sitting down with authors to delve deeper into the books they have written to uncover the story behind the story. Hello, Book Talk Today family, and welcome back to another episode of the Book Talk Today podcast. My name is Orn, I am your host, and in today's podcast, we are joined by Dr. Hitendra Wadwa. Dr. Hitendra is a professor at Columbia Business School and the founder of the Mentora Institute. His simple yet profound insight that success in life and leadership originates from within and has led to the training and transformation of thousands of executives worldwide. And today we'll be discussing his most recent book, Inner Mastery and Outer Impact. Unfortunately, I don't have a nice shiny book to show you because the team of Dr. Hitendra sent me a copy, a PDF copy for me to read. So unfortunately, I can't share the book on the nice video. But I did read the book and we had a great conversation around what he calls our five core energies. And these are energies that we get into the conversation. But we also talked about Hitendra's, Dr. Hitendra's experience growing up in India and how that shaped him, his experience with shamanism and in understanding Indian culture and the impact that had on him and how he sees life in general and how you can bring that spiritual element and understanding of your soul into the activities that you do, whether they be as a student or in business in general, which is his background and what he teaches teaches as part of the Mentor Institute. So it was a really interesting conversation and something that I've been thinking a lot about recently and hopefully you'll find valuable as well. If you haven't already, please do subscribe to the podcast. At the moment, the podcasts are quite sparse just due to things happening in work and other projects related, but I'm trying to get them out every two weeks or so. But the best way that you can support the podcast is to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Book Talk Today on YouTube. Or if you like listening on Apple or Spotify, you can follow us there and leave a review as well. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Dr. Tendra, it's great to have you on the podcast. It is wonderful to be here with you and your guests on. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, your team sent me across the book and I've been reading a lot about this concept of purpose, meaning, finding the correlation between your inner values and the external world and find the balance between that. Because I think at the moment, you know, a lot of people are having external factors about things that they want to achieve, whether it be monetary or pressures from outside society and trying to align that with your inner values can be something that is a very, very difficult. I think a lot of people struggle with that. So I think your book definitely addresses some of those concerns and, and some of those topics. And I think before we get into that, um, at the beginning of the book, you talked about sort of your personal journey and, and your childhood growing up in India. And you had this great sentence saying, uh, for me, growing up in India was like partaking in every day in a sumptuous feast of spirit. And I thought that was a really nice sentence. So I think a great introduction would be just giving your experience growing up in, in India and, and, and how that shaped you as a person. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, that's a beautiful thought, uh, you know, and a quality about my experience in growing up in India that you have zoomed in on. I'm happy to start with a reflection on that. You know, look, um, each culture is special in its own way. And one thing that I find very special about India is that a lot of the wealth and richness is something that is a little bit below this, you know, eye level, <laughs> below the surface of what is more available to our senses from the outside. So uh, for those who are observers, you know, and tourists, you know, they may not get the full story unless they dive deeper into the stirring of spirit that happens when you interact with people from that culture. And 
you know, again, different cultures have their own very, very special qualities. I can talk about how much I have enjoyed, you know, so many other parts of the world in their own special ways. But what I found in India in growing up is that, you know, God was everywhere. And and I don't mean God, you know, in a sense of a bearded, you know, father figure sitting on some judging throne and, you know, unleashing all kinds of blessings or, you know, or punishments on people. But God as in a view that there is an underlying intelligence in the universe, an underlying creative force behind everything, that um, there is a timeless relationship between each of us as a creative or a divine spark that has emerged from it, and that the ultimate goal, you know, in creation and in life is to find a way to merge back into it. And whether it is the bhajans as they call it or the chants you know in india the chanting kind of you know or it is just the everyday kind of presence of that you know kind of like divine force that you see in people's homes in their cars in their shops in everyday conversations in their rituals in the books that you know lie on people's bookshelves in the conversations that happen at times I found it to be a very sumptuous feast because, you know, you could never escape it. And it was beautiful because it was reminding me and awakening me at a very early stage to look for what is timeless, what is the essence, what is maybe hidden to the human eye, but is approachable through the heart, you know, is approachable through the intuition. So when you, how how did you sort of learning what you learned growing up and having that understanding of that? perhaps spiritual element, you know, so much of your professional life has been, you know, studying and spending time in university and perhaps in the scientific realm and the academic realm. How do you balance those two together? Because I think a lot of people struggle with with that. Yeah, initially, I dichotomized and I, for the most part on the outside, did the usual things of wanting to pursue excellence and success and you know, the trappings of, you know, um, yeah, just privilege, power, uh, you know, attainment, um, elitism in some ways, wanting to be part of the best, you know, and then be in the mm. even more elite you know, <laughs> community and crew and feel really good from within because I'm like, you know, striving to be at the top of my game. Yeah. And in the meanwhile, from within, you know, on the inside, I was quietly pursuing a little bit of my own spiritual quest, reading, studying, questioning, Uh, shifting, expanding my beliefs, connecting with, you know, monks and nuns and, um, you know, wanting to be very curious about truth seekers from across different faiths. Um, I gravitated much much more towards the the mystics, you know, people who have sought to incorporate some kind of an experiential element in the spiritual pursuit, not just an intellectual understanding or a ritualistic following from the outside. Um, And these were like two completely separate parallel worlds. Most of my social life was in the outer world. And this inner thing was a select group of people, perhaps a couple mm-hmm. of folks in my family, like my parents, and then um, and then these monks and nuns. Um, but I found over the course of my late teens and 20s, a growing sense of dryness, you know, of spirit from within in the way I was leading my life, because I was not allowing this part of me to be engaged with and activated in my everyday pursuits. And so by the time I reached my early 30s, in a sense, like the game was up for me. You know, I wasn't caught up in like some deep chasm of depression or, you know, or, or something. But I was certainly starting to feel a great sense of meaninglessness to all the outer pursuits if they weren't anchored and connected within some organic and whole way with who I felt I was. You know, from within, I also felt I was doing a disservice to my inner journey because I wasn't investing enough effort and time and discipline in it as I felt I needed to, to fully, fully discover my core, you know, uh, who I was or the very essence of my being. And so um, that's when I um, basically put, a little, in a sense, life on pause. I uh, went to a couple of ashrams in India where I had <laughs> long had an association, uh, reconnected with some of the, you know, uh, mentors there that I've had, you know, on the spiritual side from from the monks and and really kind of committed that, Regardless of what happens, I am going to start dedicating some daily time to my, you know, spiritual life, to my contemplative practice, 
and not give myself the excuse that I'm I'm too busy, I'm too caught up in all these external demands. And, you know, I'll, I'll always have, you know, another decade, you know, in which to pursue that in my 40s and 50s and beyond. I, I decided that, you know, I, I have to start now because this is a lifelong quest and I don't want to like let too many decades go by. And that mm. shift, that commitment, you know, to start with that um, inner discipline as my, you know, first like, rock you know to really anchor my day in um really brought about a major shift i i started to feel very grounded um and over time started to have these more creative ideas that you know i'm in the business world i'm teaching at a business school there's no reason i can't push the envelope a little bit and start having conversations with my students even though i'm teaching them marketing mm. about life and about what it takes to thrive and succeed in the long term and what are the rules and principles of how to flourish and all of that. And so I started to experiment and do that. And the more of it I did, the more I realized how much more license there was for me to expand that. And so over a period of time, a couple of years or so, I ended up creating a class on what I call personal leadership, you know, and success. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, for the most part, it's in service of, it's in service of that hunger that you're talking about in all of us to be very authentic to ourselves, but also very invested in success and attainment in the world. But really it was in service for my own hunger to want to kind of bring my outer life and inner life into one whole place. And I just feel so grateful for the opportunity I have had at Columbia Business School. And since then, uh, through my mentor institute as well, to f validate more and more, especially in the times that we live in, that um, there is no reason to actually separate those two, that one can joyfully engage, you know, with all of our outer challenges, even moments of conflict and disconnection from a place of core expression of who we truly are from within, fighting and engaging in those outer battles, but from a deep expression of our purpose, our values, you know, expressed thoughtfully, expressed at times tactfully, but with deep sense of intentionality to every moment. How did your experience at the ashram shape that? Because I think a lot of people, you know, they have these thoughts about, you know, they want to go live in the mountains or they want to go live in the forest away from things to perhaps de-stress, but really try and find themselves. Um, how was your experience at the ashram and, and what were some of the core principles that you really learned during your time there? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think there were like three in particular that I would offer. The first is it got me much more in touch with my core. I speak about that in my in my book, um, you know, the idea that each of us, each of us has that very, very special place within us, you know, from where when we are in touch with it, we are beyond ego and attachments and insecurities and you know, we are rooted in the best, you know, version of ourselves and we feel a great sense of upliftment and inspiration and purity, you know, uh, in, in everything that we, we do when we are operating from that space. So going to the ashram would, you know, connect me with that part of me uh, through the environment, the conversations, the um, daily you know, meditation practices that I would do there. The second, um, the second way in which it really impacted me was that it made me see life from a different lens, you know, as opposed to the purpose of life being to just kind of climb up like some corporate ladder or other, you know, professional, uh, you know, success ladder. And, and that would bring me to fulfillment. I was able to step back, you know, from those formulas and ask myself in a very, um, you know, uh, in a very sort of uh, first principles way, you know, Hitendra, mm -hmm. what is success to you? What is a, a good life to you? If you were... 90 now and you're looking back you know in your twilight years what would your life have to be for you to be deeply fulfilled and in asking those questions the right way i was able to recognize that i needed to bring a much greater service element to my work i needed to connect as you were saying the inner and the outer much more um you know fluidly and organically rather than you know kind of like dress for success and then show up in the world and try to conform mm -hmm. and be whatever it is that my friends and my world was wanting from me and then and then go back and retreat into my own personal space every now and then when I was no 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 th there was there was actually a need to bring those two together that was I think the second big realization for me and the third one for which I you know I mean all of these but 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 the third one uh, I want to highlight in particular my uh, spiritual teaching drawn from, uh, you know, a, a yoga master called Yogananda, you know, one of the things he emphasized was that, you know, 
yogis are not individuals who seek to only escape from the world. Um, you know, everyone has a role to play. And for most of us, that role is going to be in the world. And he talked about how to be in the world without necessarily being of the world, right? Mm. And so you want to engage very actively, roll up your sleeves, be fully present in every moment and take on, you know, the heroic quest that you have to do to beautiful things, whether you're an artist or a scientist or a doctor or a lawyer or a business person or what have you. you, you engage and do whatever, you know, is in service of, you know, humanity and the role you're playing. But as you're doing that, you're always very connected with that core and you're seeking that um, inner centeredness and inner calmness and inner joy that, you know, that flow of love from within unconditionally. Um, and that is how your core potential is finding outer expression, even in the messiness of daily life with uh, affairs and conditions that you don't always control. Um, mm. So that realization that actually um, it is not just a possibility, but it's actually a responsibility to grow, not just from the inside out, but also from the outside in, which means to use every life experience, every role in life, every situation one is thrust in as an opportunity to ask, how can I activate my core? And how can I activate other people's core in the present situation to bring out the best in them and to bring out the best in me? And that's what those change makers, leaders, discoverers, inventors, creative minds, who we have, you know, really admired over the course of history, who've left a very um, beautiful footprint on the sands of time. Uh, when we look back and say, oh, wow, that, that was a life well lived. You know, it's hard to mimic them from the outside, but actually when you understand who they were on the inside, then you realize, ah, oh, you know, what they were doing is in their conditions, in their time, in the situations they were, they were just expressing the beautiful qualities of their core. I think a large part of that is like an attachment thing. Because I think a lot of them perhaps detach from any expectations what anyone else has of them. And I think that seems to be a, a common theme across people who are perhaps have this big chasm in between the inner and the outer. They have this expectation or they have this attachment to what they expect of themselves or what more importantly, what other people expect of them, whether it be, you know, family, friends, bosses, society as a whole. So I think a level of attachment or detachment is, is possibly needed for most. Yeah, um, on that, that's a beautiful point. It's a beautiful point. Um, in my book, I refer to these like five energies, as 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 you know, um, that yeah. each of us expresses from our core purpose that you've already spoken about, wisdom, growth, love, and self realization. The second of those five, which is wisdom, um, for each of these five, by the way, for each of these five energies, I um, basically offered a five stage kind of path that we can take to help really activate that energy in our life you know five stages for purpose five for wisdom and so on and in the five stages for wisdom you know the fifth stage uh oh, sorry the fourth the fourth stage of wisdom is exactly what you're just saying you know is non-attachment um mm -hmm. wisdom the capacity for us to accept truth in every situation in whichever form it comes comfortable or uncomfortable but it's the truth so we have to defer to it bow to it honor it and embrace it um, well, you know, mastering your intellect is one thing, but you also got to go beyond that to like stage one, as I call it, which is mastering your emotions and stage two, which is just organizing your thoughts so that you eliminate all the mental distortions from it. And, you know, stage three, which is actually looking very honestly at your belief system and making sure that there are no blinding beliefs that are actually locking you into a certain frame in which you're observing and perceiving things around you and not mm -hmm. allowing yourself to see things in their fullest light. So those are the first three. Um, and I was just sharing those to lead to the logic of the fourth that actually each of these stage by stage is going deeper and deeper and deeper into the human psyche, into the human condition, and is therefore allowing you to have a much more multiplicative, transformative kind of impact on your growth and your, you know, advancements in, in life. And and so to your point uh, of non-attachment, it is such a beautiful idea that you're just bringing up, such a beautiful idea. It looks like you've had some, you know, you know, experience with it, right? And in, in your own journey, which which I'll be curious to hear. Um, but, but well, it's, 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 it's because it's, it's, it's yeah, it's because I'm, I'm Muslim and, and we grew up Muslim and our family's very religious and so much a part of the teaching is a detachment not detachment from 
you know, just material possessions, the world in general to a degree, but also like your own desires and any blinding bits of ego or, or expectations that you have. I think it's such a really important point is like you can live, but don't live like that. What you said was, was amazing. It's like you can live in the world but not let the world uh, world live on you or something like that <laughs> i probably butchered yeah. what you said <laughs> but it's yeah, like this idea the world, that you of the world you know <laughs> yeah don't yeah fully you know. identified with the world <laughs> yeah don't don't be so attached to it i think is is, is sort of that, that main point within that yeah it's so beautiful to hear that from you on and uh, for you to share it as an key you know element of your faith um i think um you know, I've seen that same ethos being expressed in, you know, pretty much all the great faiths. You know, it's yeah. it's a key part of uh, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, each in their own beautiful ways just kind of invites all of us, isn't it, to not get so caught up in ego and materiality and outer markers of success and how people are giving you a certain fan following or not, you know, but, but always seek to be true to yourself and follow in a sense the right inner guidance and, and all of that. So, but I actually, you know, let me, let me build on what you said with one story, um, which you, you, you might enjoy. Tell me what you think of it. So, so if you're not going to be attached to your, you know, your, the wishes and whims and demands of your employers or your friends and family or society, and then, then who are you going to be attached to? You know, very, and so, you know, most of the great faiths will talk about your conscience, you know, your inner voice, and uh, so there's a one, and you know, Gandhi was a key proponent of that. You know, he's one of the individuals I've studied deeply, right? And so um, uh, one American journalist once asked him, and I share the story in the book, that, uh, Mr. Gandhi, you know, you, you emphasize so much, you know, the inner voice and, you know, guiding, being guided by the inner voice. I mean, but there are many people who claim that, you know, they are being guided by the inner voice who are deluded and who do like evil and bad, bad things. And so yeah. people start to become very skeptical about this idea of this inner voice thing, because like the voice can get you in trouble. So uh, yeah. let me ask you this, like, before you really follow that inner voice, you know, and surrender to it, do you have to first be convinced that it's truly your inner voice? Like, like, do you have to be first convinced that it's your, and only then you surrender to it? Now, surrender is like non-attachment, right? Like you're, you're saying, I'm not attached. I'm just going to follow this voice, right? Uh, and all that. And Gandhi looked at him as though, like, are you, like, have you had, like, any understanding of anything I've been talking to you all this time? Like, because, like, <laughs> what you just said is the complete opposite. You know, so the journalist mentions that Gandhi gave him this look as though, like, my heavens, like, all is lost. Like, you know, your understanding is like so far from what I'm actually trying to tell you. Because then Gandhi said, he said, actually, it's the complete opposite. It's not that you first get convinced it's your inner voice and then you surrender to it. It's that you first have to surrender. And once you surrender, then you are sure it's the voice that is the right voice. So you have to surrender your... <sighs> Is it expectations? You are surrender your ego to then hear that true voice? It's the non-attachment that you're talking about, right? Like surrender and non-attachment yeah. are essentially the same idea, right? Like surrender is saying, mm. don't be attached. Don't like, let's say, for example, let's make this very concrete for people. Let's say you're interviewing for a certain role and you've got a certain candidate and you're feeling good about the candidate, but you're also feeling a little bit like, I don't know, there's something not making you fully comfortable yet, right? So you might like go within in a moment of stillness, take a walk in nature and ask your inner voice, you know, ask your intuition, what guidance do you have for me? Yay mm -hmm. or nay, right? Now, if you haven't surrendered, then it's quite possible, let's say if you are really attached to filling that position and getting this like task out of the way, you might have an emotional urge that tells you hire the person, hire the person. You know, these these other things are kind of trivial, you know, hire the person. And then you might regret that six months later when you say, oh, those that right, you know, those signs were all around me and I didn't pay attention to those and all of that, right? Mm. And so um, attachment can be to subtle things like you want a certain outcome and, and, and you want the inner voice to almost tell you that that's the right outcome. I should marry this person. You know, we should do this. I should, but it's really not from a place of non-attachment, you know, you're doing it from a place of an attachment to a certain outcome. So surrender is the idea of just cleaning up in a sense, cleaning up your inner space 
so that the inner voice can speak to you. Mm. Um, so that it's your inner voice that's speaking to you, not an ego, an attachment, an insecurity or something. Does, does that make sense? I'll, I'll, yeah, definitely makes sense. And I'm really interested in how you take these ideas and this philosophy that you've learned into your teaching and into your leadership coaching, because, you know, people would think the the roles of philosophy and spirituality are very separate to the role of business and academia to a degree. So I'd, I'd really be interested about what your take is and what your mindset is about taking these teachings and applying it to, to that, to that other, that other side. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, um, you know, I, I, I love the way you connected a philosophy, uh, around non-attachment to, to, to your faith. And I think that, um, you know, if all of us could become more free and open and comfortable in taking the best of what our faith has to offer or the spiritual precepts behind our culture, you know, I think we would create a much more richer and whole environment in any profession, certainly in, in, in business and in academia. Um, so uh, so I, I really don't see a separation as much as we have in the past sought to make it because the spiritual mm. side, the spirit, if you want to call it the spirit, is is the essence, the very core of who we are. Why should that be suppressed or shoved under a rug when I show up at work, right? So that would be the idea. Now, mm. how do I operationalize this? And, you know, that's a very good question. So first, I had to respect that there would be skeptics. You know, there would be individuals who would feel like, eh, you know, why should I trust you, Hidendra? And so mm. I ended up um, doing a fair amount of research around what's the latest science on this topic so that we could approach this from a very scientific lens. And anything I found that was... Um, not being, you know, in a sense, uh, offered up by science, I kept it out of the leadership training programs or the classrooms. I only limited the offering to the, those things I had scientific data and evidence for. And the mm -hmm. good news is that over the last couple of decades, there has been an explosion of research and psychotherapy and psychology and neuroscience and behavioral economics and sociology and medicine that is really informing us about human nature and giving us very objective fact-based logic about sort of what it takes for us to flourish and you know advance our health advance our happiness a high performance at work and our harmony in relationships so those are the measures i was using health happiness high performance at work and and and, and harmony mm -hmm. you know in relationships and uh, so the science became like a big part of it um, the second is that I then approach um, all of these ideas from a very logical place, you know, break it down into small steps, you know, help every one of us appreciate the logic of what it is that we are, you know, talking about. I'll give you an example, like, you know, there's a quality that is age old, you know, in spiritual traditions of appreciation, looking for the goodness in the other person and affirming the goodness and constantly being in that frame where you're constantly reminding yourself of those uplifting qualities and the people that you love and and and, and people that you meet and, and you know and, and a business person might say but that's like impractical and it's just like you know not useful in business and i might say well let me tell you the logical reasons why that's a good thing to do when you're in a conversation you're giving somebody feedback there's a risk that that person might end up feeling judged there's a risk that the person might end up feeling like, oh my career is at stake there's a risk that the person might feel like you just monolithically dislike them, you know, with what you're saying, mm -hmm. and you're just not yeah. supportive of them. So therefore, when you actually mix, let's say, criticism in your feedback, where you're actually talking about something that they've not done right, that they need to fix, a certain quality that they don't have, they need to cultivate. If while you're doing that, you can also affirm something positive in them that you see, a certain contribution that they've made, which are really good, um, you know, a certain strength that they bring to the team, which is very unique, then, or a certain potential they have, which you haven't seen fully, you know, developed yet, but, but you see that potential, you, you see like where they could go with it. If you appreciatively affirm that, then you are putting all that noise to rest, you know, and they're actually becoming a lot more receptive and a lot more open, a lot more comfortable. They're better able to listen. You also are in a space where you're not just monolithically judging them, but you're recognizing that each of us is, you know, a diamond in the rough and there's a part of it which is the diamond and the shining and there's part of it is the rough and that you're polishing. And so your attitude towards the other person becomes much more supportive and mentoring oriented. So that's a logical way to help convince somebody that appreciation is a wonderful action for us to have in our back pocket and pull out and use from time to time, not just in positive, good celebratory moments when we're actually feeling like, oh, what an awesome team, but actually in the toughest moments when there is conflict, when there is doubt, when there is criticism, you know, in a conversation. So, so that's the second thing that I do to manifest some of these spiritual ideas in a very, very practical, logical way in um, mm. a kind of like 
the doggy dog ambitious kind of way that we've thought about the business world. The third thing I would say is that things have started to change. Uh, COVID times have just accelerated that change. But I would say that even over the last 10 years, I started to see that trend. Business, for instance, which used to be a lot about just performance, right? We have to serve our investors and maximizing shareholder mm -hmm. returns is starting to get much more open to the idea that there is a role we play in society and there's an impact we have in society and we need to be mindful of that. And we need to have a very positive purpose that actually helps advance humanity. And that the people who are doing all of this stuff are people, they're human beings, they're not robots. They have to be honored and respected and included and made to feel welcomed and a feel a sense of belonging and connection in, in the workplace. And, and they have the right to feel authentic you know, to who they are, et cetera. And so the three, legs of the business tool now is no longer just you know performance but it's mm -hmm. purpose and people you know melded with performance and as soon as you start getting the purpose you know and the people part you know of this you know into play then you start coming to these energies you know the energy of love of, of like taking joy in other people's joy and finding success in other people's success which is how you know i define love in in the book and in my teachings the energy of purpose of course the energy of wisdom that makes you very carefully and mindfully think about What's the truth in the situation? How can we up a game in terms of performance? Uh, but also the energy of growth that you know we are constantly seeking to grow as an organization because people people want to grow. People want to become better versions, you know, of of themselves. Um, and so, uh, so yeah. So I think um, in the times we live in, I can't I can't imagine a better time in the history of at least you know the recent millennia that we've gone through where um, humanity, institutions, business, all are starting to recognize that there are some some aspirational gaps here between you know who we want to be versus who we are today uh and so i'm i'm you know starting to see the possibility of you know the, the work i'm doing uh as one of many you know doing doing beautiful well-intentioned work certainly you are with, with your podcast as well uh for us to come in and fill fill that space i think one of the things you you mentioned uh, just just now is this idea of being skeptical of people i think a lot of people are very skeptical of people and they don't trust people initially but then they open up to them perhaps in in the future and i think that that to me is is one of those things that i battled with initially when i started in the working world is like you're automatically there's this there's this inner voice in you i don't know where it comes from it might be just me <laughs> it's just like you you're just automatically skeptical of someone even before you even met them they're like an other they're a stranger um, and then, you know, you just have this block before you even started speaking to them. And, and I think so much of what you're talking about this idea of just being open to, to experiences, opening to open to people, and then you can, you can then nurture those relationships and then you can really work together rather than just having this immediate sort of block to anyone you, that you meet. You know, Warren Buffett, um, you know, very successful man, you know, for those who don't know him, and I think most of us will, um, and he's actually a Columbia Business School alum, which I'm, you know, really very proud of. Uh, um, you know, one of the richest men in the world, right? Uh, Self-made in so many ways. So he, um, uh, actually, I should come back and talk about, you know, qualifying that comment about being self-made. Uh, let me come back to that. But he has this uh, beautiful uh, practice. Uh, which speaks to what you were just saying, uh, where, you know, it, it, I like to call it like the Warren Buffett 10% rule. And it is to say that um, within everyone, 10% of that individual is really inspiring. And so he says, when I meet somebody, my, uh, you know, quest, you know, is the, 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 the puzzle that I'm trying to solve is like, okay, what's that 10% of you, which when I can have it get sparked, like, I'd be so inspired, like, you know, and, and this would be such mm. a rewarding and beautiful conversation. And, uh, and so over, over the over the years, you know, in, in my classes and um, in our teachings at Mentora, you know, um, we, we've collected together certain questions that we can all ask, you know, as part of us in, in the spirit of what you might call appreciative inquiry, you know, questions where the assumption in the question is like, there is something really special in you. And yes, in this moment, you know, you're serving this role of being a taxi driver and I'm, I'm you know, your, your ride. But we have five minutes. And we are having a conversation. Let me ask you this question to see if I can ignite that 10%, you know, that will inspire me. Um, and so, you know, like just a question like, sir, like what's, you know, what's your big dream in life? Ah, it's just amazing. You know, it's just amazing the kind of responses you get if you ask that yeah, at yeah. dinner. 
people or just in the happenstance form, or even just you know walk around with your spouse or your mother and just ask her that question i mean it's amazing what what are some of the 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 feedback that you get from your students when you start teaching this because I, I think earlier you mentioned that you try and approach them from a very logical point of view but what were some of the the journeys that they've been have that that they've been having and the feedback that you've got from from teaching this and and when they've gone out into the world and, and experienced it yeah i mean i have learned so much from those journeys and quests and um one of them wasn't even from a student um i gave a talk on some of this um to the parents of uh, graduating students you know on what they call like parents day and i remember years later i met um that student who graduated that day and whose parents had been there at that talk and he said pesa i just want to share with you how you know much that talk meant to my family because my father started this contemplation practice you know right after that conversation that you had with with them and he's been steady with it ever since and i just thought that was so beautiful and um you know how many like of us you know would do that like we we, we you know we 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 hear a podcast we really get inspired by or a talk or we visit and listen to a class and and now you're at a stage where it's your child who's graduating you know from an mba so you know you feel like yeah. you made it you know and this is now their time to grow <laughs> you know you're kind of where you are and here this gentleman basically comes in more to celebrate his child's graduation and picks up something that a random professor just said and makes it his own and then grows in some beautiful ways in the years ahead so so there've been you know stories like this that over the years have actually made me feel more accountable to myself in my own growth journey like tender you can't like just be teaching this stuff and you know um celebrating other people's you know success stories you know with it you 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 better make sure that you're doing your bit to um invest in you know these these efforts and growth yourself but um you know uh the i think the most meaningful uh feedback that i've received have been in the form of stories you know people talking about how there was a certain chapter in their life there was a certain relationship issue in their life a certain loss that they faced or a certain a new awakening they've come to about um you know what their true purpose is and uh a shift that they're making in their you know professional choices uh, accordingly uh you know uh that it's those stories that um I felt most impacted by and that give me the most tangible uh, understanding of what people are carrying away now let's let's not delude ourselves you know out of 100 people you know there might be 15 or 20 of them that might you know at some point share a story and go through a major transformation others might mm-hmm. go through you know minor but important growth as well and then some you know some might have you know just remembered it as a fond experience so might even have forgotten it you know <laughs> over time and i respect that you know uh, each person will ha- have their own time um one of the things i seek to do in 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 um everything that we teach and I write about in the book as well is recognize that <clears throat> you know there's one mountain top they're not like 17 different mountain tops you know there is objectively when we when i study the mystical traditions in the world when i study the latest science that is coming out in human nature they're all pointing to something quite consistent as the highest state of human attainment you know where there is unconditional love and unconditional joy and a sense of peacefulness and a sense of you know like you said non attachment you know uh, so so those are qualities that one almost universally finds in all the great teachings and the you know the latest science on what people who scale that peak will report and others will observe in them but while there might be one mountain top you know there are many different paths to it um and so um i don't think any of us can claim that my path is the only right path for everyone and it needs to be imposed on on you know on every student in in the class and so um so my quest is to afford people with a set of laws of human nature if you want to call it or principles mm-hmm. if you want to call it you know a certain structure and scaffolding like the idea of the core and the five energies and the stages to get to those uh you know uh, activate those energies uh and then to invite them to um in the moment in time that they are thrust and with what you know their inner stirrings might be to pick 
you know, their battleground to make some investment in growth, but um, choose for themselves, you know, where they are um, feeling most ignited. Um, and to that end, leave it leave it up to them. So, um, so I don't see one story playing out from a class. I don't see it coming out in one singular point in time, like when the class is going on and just after. Um, I, I do see um, seeds being sowed that germinate uh, at times in beautiful and unexpected ways. Sometimes, you know, mm. a few years later when I hear back from them, I've had the blessing of doing this work now for about 15 years. And um, so uh, with, the, with the passage of that much time, you know, um, one, one starts to collect uh, a, a lot of very meaningful and inspiring, inspiring moments. Mm. Can you just elaborate on this idea that you just talked about, about the mountain? about how everyone is sort of trying to achieve the same type of thing and people perhaps try and get there in different ways. There's many different paths up to that mountaintop. And you just mentioned that, you know, it seems to be consistent throughout all philosophies, faiths, even, you know, scientific experiments, you know, we're all looking to to get to that place. So can you just elaborate on what perhaps that mountaintop is? Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I have 14 chapters in my book and the first 13 were kind of you know getting more or less set in my mind over the last uh, five years um but the 14th chapter was uh something i decided ultimately that i i have to i have to i have to write because here i am inviting all of us to you know discover and activate the beauty the magic that lies at our core and offering you know, these five energies and the stages to these energies. And yet then beyond that, I'm just kind of leaving it open, <laughs> you know, and I, I, mm. I felt I had to bring it to, um, a, a, you know, a greater point of closure, even though as we get to talk about that stage, that final ultimate, you know, mountaintop, the science there is more emergent than it is mature. Uh, I still had to go there. And so I mm. ended up, um, you know, uh, describing that and talking about that more by tapping into uh, the um, practice of mystics across the ages and through stories, stories of people mm. we all look up at, like an Abraham Lincoln and a Mother Teresa and a Gandhi and a Johannes Brahms, you know, the composer, or, uh, you know, Puccini, Puccini as well, or, or uh, Picasso or uh, an Einstein, uh, you know, um, Shakespeare. I mean, any or all of these people actually were talking about and pointing to the same thing. And what is that thing? And that thing is that imagine that you make this journey and arrive at that place where you are perfectly activated at your core, at the deepest, fullest part of who you are within. And imagine if I also do my work, go on my path and arrive at my core. Is it possible that you and I will find that we meet there? that we've actually arrived at the same place. And that's what I call the universal core. And that is what the mystics across all great faiths have, you know, spoken about. Hmm. They were individuals who from, you know, millennia back were not satisfied with the idea that if they live a virtuous life, they might actually then get to some rewards in the afterlife by, you know, a higher power or God or what have you. Um, they were drawn to the idea that what can I do in the here and now to experience divine grace, to experience a sense of transcendence, of attunement to something much vaster than just this physical body in this place at this point in time. And they developed their own forms of practice, you know, that we see across all the, you know, great faiths, you know, I'm, you know, um, referring here to the Kabbalah traditions in Judaism or, for example, the Sufi, you know, you know, practices in Islam or, or, the yogi and uh, yoga, you know, kind of com community within within Hinduism and, you know, Buddhism in general is all founded on that quest of, you know, the yeah, the, the the middle path and then the um, the the meditative kind of you know traditions, etc. You know, the desert saints in Christianity, for example. Uh, so mysticism is everywhere, you know, in all of these great faiths. Mm. And essentially, what they're saying is that look, um, one way to think about the universe is that it came out from some creative intelligence. That intelligence is omniscient, which means it knows everything. It's omnipotent. It's actually all powerful. It's um, you know all, you know omnipresent, so it's everywhere, and it's also all loving. It's an all-loving force, and each of us is like a drop, you know, coming out from the ocean, 
And the whole journey in life is to dissolve that drop into that ocean from a consciousness standpoint, you know, not necessarily a physical standpoint, so that we can, you know, reclaim our true home, you know, from, from where we have emerged. And uh, therefore, as we strive to make our heart purer, as we strive to walk away from our ego, as we strive to practice gratitude and appreciation and, you know, optimism and an indomitable spirit and a contemplative deep attunement with peace, you know, et cetera, we are actually walking up that mountain and we are getting closer and closer to that place. And gradually over the course of life, the inner voice starts to then become more active. And if you tune into that inner voice, that's kind of like your antennae through which you're catching the radio mm. signals that are coming from that creative force. And then mm. based on the position you've been put in at the point in time you've been put in, you'll have a certain role to play at a certain moment. And you can be guided into playing that role to the best of your potentialities, in a sense, with that with that inner rudder that you ha have now within you. Um, and that's a beautiful journey to be on. And at that point, you feel very much at peace, even though you're not fully reached that place yet, because you're tuning in, you're feeling guided, and you're feeling harmonized, you know, with all forces of nature around you. Uh, and when you're at that place, what is that place like? Um, from the reports that I get from those who I respect, you know, have gone up to that mountaintop, whether it's the great prophets from any of the great traditions or or, or great saints or, or others who are active in the world, but very connected with that, like to me, like an Abraham Lincoln. Um, it's a place of unconditional peace, unconditional joy, unconditional love, and a deep sense of attunement, not just with every other human life, but with life in general, with creation mm -hmm. in general not just on planet Earth, but all across the universe. Um, and what's beautiful to me is that in our very human lives, you have a lot of proof points of people who in some ways seemed kind of just like human, all of us, but were also drawing their genius, their creativity from that place, not mm. just seeing their mind as a database, in which they were pouring in a lot of information and data and then trying to process it to come out with like creative ideas, but seeing the mind like as a browser, you know, as, as a channel through which yeah. the infinite intelligence of the universe can flow through them. And what's beautiful is that, you know, while science may yet not be there to prove that, it's starting to take steps in that direction. Mysticism is starting to get a lot of respect from uh, neuroscientists, whereas in the past it was being rejected as a form of... Uh, delusional, schizophrenic thinking. Um, mm. The Brahms and Picassos and Tennyson's and uh, Puccini's, as I mentioned in the last chapter in a book, have actually talked about how their greatest creative spark was something where ideas just flowed into them, not mm. things that they had to effortfully work on. Um, and there's a whole science of what they call near-death experiences today that is also starting to, you know, in a sense, validate some of these uh, possibilities of what magic there might be in the universe and in our own consciousness and our connection with it that, you know, only perhaps, you know, as society advances, you know, future future generations will be able to more broadly discover. But in the meanwhile, for the truth seekers and the mystics in, in amongst us, you know, the opportunity is there. One of the artists that I, I read a book on Michelangelo and we had an art historian come on the podcast, uh, Andrew Graham Dixon, we were talking about the Sistine Chapel and mm -hmm. what stood out to me is he in his diaries talked about how he saw his art as his connection to the, the, the divine. So he believed that everything that he had done was him getting closer to, to the divine. And you can see that in his work because his work is somewhat divine in a sense, because how could someone mortal create something as, as beautiful as that? So I think like, I, there's something unique about artists, creatives, and what they're able to tap into, because it's like when you read a really good novel or when you see a really, really impressive piece of art, it's very, you know, uplifting to look at it. And it almost feels like it's not of this world. I'm, I'm completely with you. And um, I, I think each of us uh, on, I would say, should see us as an artist, you know, should see this canvas on which we are doing our greatest painting. I mean, you know, you could be a dad, you know, tomorrow and raising the child is like this blank canvas, you know, that you're putting a beautiful, you know, color to and painting in just through the 
act of caring, loving parenting that you're doing, you know, whether it's it's uh, in any role that you play, right? Why not think of it as, uh, you actually remind me of a quote from Martin Luther King, you know, he said, like, if you're a sweep streeter, you know, a sweep, street sweeper, sweep the streets as, you know, a great painter would make a great painting or something. And Warren mm. Buffett actually said, when I go to the office every day, he said, when I go to the office, it is like I'm just lying flat and I'm painting the Sistine Chapel. Um, so that capacity for each of us to be in that inspired state, connected state, and to see our role and our work as um, at least an invitation from life to do the most beautiful work that we can with with some divine spark behind it. How do you encourage people to find that divine spark in the work that they do? Because, you know, someone who's doing perhaps like a monotonous job or something that they see as perhaps below them to a degree how would you sort of convince them or inspire them to find that divine spark in anything that they do yeah yeah well first of all i i would say that we have to get out of this uh rank ordering of like the higher level tasks in life and roles and the lower level ones you know that's uh, to me a, you know 20th century kind of construct that we just need to start moving away from. You know, every role mm -hmm. has its dignity, has its, you know, place in society. I mean, imagine like, how would the world work if there wasn't like some number of people mm -hmm. who are very lovingly comfortable in doing tasks that, you know, uh, we don't necessarily look up at today, but that are so yeah. critical to serving, nursing, supporting, cleaning, you know, et cetera, cooking, whatever it might be that we, we look upon as, as smaller tasks. Second, I mean, like one thought experiment I encourage us to do, whenever we start to judge certain, you know, people as, oh, that person is changing the lives of millions. That one is changing the lives of billions. Meanwhile, I'm sitting here with like three direct team members and just doing, working on this little project, right? Anytime you think like that, just run this thought experiment. You're, you're standing and you're looking down on the floor and there are these like two ants like quibbling with each other as to like who's the bigger genius you know and which of them is stronger and which of them is actually doing you know more noble work than the other ant wouldn't you just look down on them and just laugh like you know you you guys have any idea the like the the the, the microscopic like order of magnitude of like what it is you're doing compared to like look at me and where i am and like mm. it's trite you know the difference between you and you whatever it might be is trite you know from my vantage point but if that's the case for just us in this finite world Imagine what it looks like from the eyes of the infinite, right? From the eyes of the infinite, any two finite acts, whether it affects one person or a billion people, I mean, there's no difference between one and a billion in the eyes of the infinite. It's kind of like, mm. you know, a rounding number error. So immediately you get humble when you realize the grandeur of the universe and the context of the infinitude of time and space, you know, comparing two acts in terms of one being more or less noble, right? And so it's, you know, it's as Rumi, he, you know, he once said, he said, you're not a drop in the ocean. You are the whole ocean in a drop. And so if you think about each of us being a whole ocean in a drop, and you think of the person that you're serving, let's say you're opening the door for someone as being a whole ocean in a drop, you're serving the whole ocean when you're serving that drop. You're serving the whole ocean. So that's, you know, that's one um, just mind shift that I encourage people to take. And then, mm. you know, there is a great science coming out today on job crafting, what they call. And it is about taking your values, your sense of purpose, and finding a way to express them in any and every role that you have to play. So they've done these beautifully eye-opening studies, for example, of janitors, you know, in uh, hospitals. And some of them just are in a very banal way seeing their work as like ho-hum and repetitive and a chore and they have to do it because they couldn't get a better job. But others are very inspired about it, you know, and, and as you might suspect, you know, these people are very inspired, you know, they don't think of their work as like just janitorial. They think of their work as like, this is a place where people are, you know, hurting in pain, might be at risk of losing their lives. And, you know, I have to make it like a very clean and safe and welcoming home away from home for them. And they get engaged with those people. They want to lift their spirits up. They're not just here to clean. They're here to kind of help be part of the healing journey as part of the ensemble between them and the nurses and the doctors. Um, and so, you know, I've seen that with taxi cab drivers. I mean, it's just amazing. Some of them, like, are feeling such a certain zestfulness in, in what they're doing. One of them was, for example, with a student of mine who shared the story later, that he's asking a lot of questions about her life journey. And initially, she's very curious, what is he doing? And then 
as he comes close to the end of his you know ride with her he just breaks off into a poem that he's composed on the spot about her with all those you know uh you know elements of a story thrown in uh and so clearly you know he was he was expressing a very creative value a value of serving entertaining humoring uh engaging right um that was beyond the official definition of a taxi cab driver's role um and mm. so let's not be limited by what the world claims to us are the three things we have to do to do justice to whatever it is that we in you know, a role we are playing let's try to bring our full heart and spirit and a sense of possibilities and our values into it and you know it's beautiful that today there's science you know around this job crafting idea that is starting to demonstrate the practical pathways we can take now as we are doing that there's no reason why we shouldn't strive for if you want to call it like higher office if you think that your true calling lies elsewhere if you think that um you know the impact you can have is so much more and so much deeper and all of that by all means you know leave your town and go to another town go and apply to another profession go and get the qualifications you need but between now and that point where you can make that transition i mean life is short is fleeting you know those moments and years are going by why not seek them to maximize the possibilities there are in those moments as well by honoring and respecting and valuing you know that opportunity life is bringing you in your present role to be the best mm. version of yourself i think it's a mindset shift as well away from this idea of individualistic achievement to collective achievement i think like a lot of people think that their achievement is their own and it's not a collective achievement for the world as a whole but i think once you see the work that you do and find an attachment to the collective whole and the collective move to a better society and a better world i think that's when you find some some level of um purpose in in the things that you do yeah it's a great it's a great question you know a uh, point you make i mean it's interesting because um you know if you look around the world there are these collectivistic societies right and then you have these more individualistic societies right and we have seen a migration from the more collectivistic to the more individualistic over time in terms of the rise of democracy and you know uh freedom and human rights and you know it's really kind of a shift towards saying like don't try to kind of like handicap or hamper or handcuff me right i'm going to be who i want to be um and we're starting to see the limits of that too with the levels mm. of depression and drug addiction and frayed social fabric and and all of that right so we know something is not yet complete and perfect in the way we design the more individualistic societies and maybe that takes us back to a more collectivistic one so you remember like a while back i was talking about warren buffett as a self made man and i was saying like i've got to come back and qualify mm. that so what yeah. you just brought up maybe you just like in intuitionally recognize that that's the prompt i need in what you just shared because that that's truly the right beautiful prompt which is we are actually not none of us are self made because of what you just said like ultimately everything is collectivistic i mean the point is like i i wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for the contribution of two people to come together and make some thing magical you know happen in conception and then from conception to all the time i spent in my mother's womb and then from there you know to come out and be nurtured and cared for by my caregivers and my kids my parents primarily right and and then the world that i inherited which has much less danger and risk and um you know poverty uh in what i experienced than what the world was 200 years ago uh mm. and the innovations made in language and education and technology i mean all of that as is faceless timeless like contributions of so many that have allowed me to then build on that right and achieve whatever it is i've achieved but i'm borrowing and sitting on top of like so much of a foundation right so to your point it's a complete myth you know, the self led individual at the same time i want to kind of like also recognize that there's something really beautiful about the individualistic quest about each of us seeking to become the perfect natural like expression of our authentic core which may not be necessarily you know the same quest and the same personality and the same character as everybody else around us in our family and our communities and and that's beautiful too to celebrate those individual paths and choices and timing of what we want to do and now the nice thing is that when you actually tune in i would offer to the collectivistic piece um you don't have to do it in a way that makes you surrender and give up your individualistic one mm. right and i like and and i think that to me is mm. the model of a perfect society because you know if you just think about like as a thought experiment and i mentioned this in the living with love chapter in my book uh if you think about how you know uh in your body if let's say the lungs started to argue with the brain so hey listen you think you're the genius up there 
you know, wait a second. I, I, what if I just like stop like bringing oxygen to you, you know, for the next like, you know, just 10 minutes, right? Like th th then then you'll be on your knees, wouldn't you? Right. And, and then the heart jumps in and say, well, wait a second, you know, wh wh what are you talking about lungs? I mean, like if I didn't transport the oxygen that you get into every cell in the body, like, you know, where do you think you'll be, you know, and, and, and you know, all that, right? And wouldn't you want to actually then tell your brains and your heart, hey, listen, stop it, stop it. I mean, that's insane for each of you to claim that you are superior and, and more important and need to be served by the others and paid better. Because ultimately, you know, it's a collective game. Just do your part mm. and then trust that others will do their part and we'll make something beautiful happen, right? And so the body mm. itself is a perfect example of the harmony that comes when people are just selflessly giving, the lungs selflessly giving of itself, the heart selflessly giving. But the funny thing is that in giving selflessly of itself, it ends up becoming the strongest and highest potential lungs that it could become. It ends up becoming the strongest, highest potential heart because a healthy heart has to be part of a healthy body. If the body's not healthy, the heart can't be healthy. But in having a healthy body and doing its work, the heart becomes really healthy. And so you have the highest potential lungs, the highest potential, the heart doesn't have to become the lungs. The lungs don't have to become the brain. They don't surrender the individuality. They become the perfect individual expressions of their unique self while also doing selfless giving and taking to be part of a collective system, right? Mm. So maybe it's an artificial divide, you know, the individual and the collective, once we understand and relate to them the right way. What do you think? I think it is, I think it's an artificial divide. And I think what, what has happened is, I think that we've gone from a society, especially in the early 1900s, that was very collectivist. And then, you know, perhaps, 1980s you know you had thatcher and reagan and it was very sort of make as much money it was very individualistic and i think there's somewhat of a retort and like you said in the last 10 years you've seen a lot of business move towards collectivist and what's our place in the world so i think it's sort of gone one way and then going another and then there's going to be some sort of balance because i think Obviously, if the world needs balance, there needs to be balance there. But I definitely think that there is a relationship between the individualistic and the collectivist that yeah. needs to perhaps be talked about more. I think that's a I think it's a beautiful way to, to end it, Dr. Hitendra. I think we we talked about many, many great concepts and I, I really appreciate your time coming on and talking about your book. Um, where's where's the best place that individuals can can get the book and, and find you and find a bit more information about yourself? Yeah, thank you, On um, Just simply Hitendra, my first name, uh, .com. So it's H-I-T-E-N-D-R-A dot com. Uh, the book, Inner Mastery, Outer Impact, is uh, available on Amazon or your other favorite uh, online bookstores and, uh, you know, in several physical bookstores as well. It was just actually released um, the other day. So it's uh, fresh <laughs> uh, in the Fresh in, off in the press. And, uh, so hitendra.com and, and, and the bookstores. I, I really enjoy this conversation on, and I hope that um, one day soon, um, yeah, we can meet and I can actually, you know, have the luxury of asking you some of these same same questions and learn more about your own personal journey because I've really enjoyed this and you bring a beautiful spirit to to your work and to our conversation. Very grateful. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. I, re I really appreciate your time and, and hopefully one day we can meet and discuss it more in person. I, I look forward to that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you and all the best to all of your listeners as well. Good luck in your own journey to your to your inner core and to the top of that mountain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hitendra. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. Hopefully you found the conversation with Dr. Hitendra useful and you can take something away from the conversation. If you're interested, you can read his book, Inner Mastery, to Impact. The link will be in the description below for you to go and get the book. We've actually released a new version of the website as well. So you can go check out that in the link below and hopefully you can go and have a look at some of the episodes there. Thank you again for listening to the podcast and I'll see you again in the next episode.